Hello everyone and welcome back to Towergate. It is Towergate day number 1235-1235, Monday, August 31st, 2020. Thank you so much for tuning in. Okay, so let's uh, talk about the latest uh, news in the last 24 hours about Spygate. And uh, let's start right here with uh, the Sunday morning interview uh, by Maria Bartiromo with uh, John Ratcliffe, who's currently the ODNI, Director of National Intelligence. So before we get into this, let's just remember that it was actually the release uh, of those Kevin Kleinsmith documents by Ratcliffe that uh, led to his being charged or his pleading guilty uh, to a crime. So Maria Bartromo going through some questions about Spygate and uh, she learned this from John Ratcliffe. Uh, Ratcliffe says that he is going to be releasing more documents. He said that he has been and will continue to work with John Durham and his investigators. He said that he has been and will continue to coordinate with Durham on these releases so as not to prejudice Durham's work or investigation. So that was very, uh, very good information to get because uh, we really haven't heard much from Ratcliffe since he became OD and I. Uh, we know he has uh, author authorized the release of some documents, as did Richard Gunnell before him. But we really didn't know how much he was involved in the Durham investigation. Well, obviously, he's not involved in the Durham investigation, but he is the person who would be providing documents that would either A, be documents that Durham or his investigators requested, or B, documents which Ratcliffe would discover on his own and determine would be something that would be important to the Durham investigators to have in their possession. So uh, again, he has been since he's become ODNI. He says he has been and will continue to work with Durham and his investigators. Uh, the reason why he's just not releasing a lot of stuff right now is because he says that it's uh, could prejudice um, Durham's work or his investigation. So there's an explanation for that. He says that essentially with Durham, working with Durham, that they're essentially working on parallel paths, which means that Durham himself is, is working on his investigation moving forward, but Ratcliffe is also reviewing a lot of uh, intelligence-related documents, and that he kind of has his own uh, investigation going on, and that they're working on parallel tracks, and that he's having to constantly communicate with Durham to find out what he needs, or maybe tell Durham he's found something that would be interesting to him, but that he can't get ahead of Durham in his investigation because it is a criminal investigation and some of the documents that could be released could cause a problem, so that's why he's working on a parallel track with Durham. Ratcliffe was asked about the leaks and whether or not they are being investigated. Uh, Ratcliffe said, oh yes, the leak investigation is ongoing. It is real. They are doing a leak investigation. He said that he has been providing documents uh, and that something else he said he's been doing is providing crime reports. Now, I've never heard of anything like that before, but Ratcliffe explained it. He said, when I come across information, intelligence, evidence, whatever, that there may be a crime involved because of something I've viewed, then I can do what's called a crime report, essentially report that shows that there that he believes that he has seen evidence of a crime, and he says he's currently um, passing those crime reports over to Durham, and he says that he has done so up to this point on a number of occasions. So Ratcliffe is feeding. Durham crime reports, evidence he's found from reviewing classified information that shows possible evidence of a crime. <clears throat> so yes, it was a pretty good interview. It was the first time we've really heard from, uh, maybe the second time, uh, but the last time was on another matter dealing primarily with China. So, uh, and of course they talked about China as well, um, I'm Maria Bartromo on Sunday morning. But there was a few questions there. 
she dug in a little bit about uh, Spygate related matters and how he's working with the Durham investigation. So I was pretty happy with what I heard from Ratcliffe. Uh, he is a straight shooter. We know that. He's definitely not a deep stater. And I think we can take him at his word for what he said. So clearly he is providing information to Durham. He's, uh, as well as I assume he's talking about John Bash on the leak in, in, uh, investigations. And uh, probably that involves the unmaskings as well. So certainly uh, he's also providing crime reports uh, where he finds evidence where a crime may have been committed. So he is still actively involved and uh, in a positive way at trying to get to the bottom of the major crime of the century, let's just say. So I stumbled across something very interesting happened on Sunday morning. On Saturday late afternoon, I was just doing some research for today's video, and I stumbled upon an article which was talking about the recent deposition, behind closed door deposition, from Joe Pienka. And um, it said in the article that, well, you know, the transcripts have not been released. At some point they may be, but at this point they haven't been. But the person writing the article said that they have sources uh, who are familiar with some of what was going down in that interview, that deposition. And he provided some very interesting uh, information about what his source is telling him that they were talking to Pinka about and what they were asking him about. And I thought, wow, this is really good. I read through the story and I thought, wow, tomorrow I'll have to come back to the story and take some notes because this is really some interesting things we're learning here. So then on Sunday afternoon when I went back to begin putting together my notes for this video, I went back and typed into Google the same search terms I originally used where I discovered that article. But when I did it on Sunday morning, I couldn't get the article, I couldn't find it. Now the first time I typed them search terms in, it popped right up on the first page, like the second or third option. But on Sunday, I went through page after page after page, so I went to the last page before you start repeating, never found it. So I thought, that's strange, so I did it again, same result. And I thought, hmm, that's strange. And so then I started using some other terms associated with what I was originally searching for to see if I could find it that way. Never could. Spent probably over an hour trying to, you know, reacquire that article. Now this wasn't, if I remember correctly, I can't remember exactly what the what the what the article de, uh, URL was, but it's one that I resource from time to time. Uh, it's not like a major major deal, but it's certainly one that I resource from time to time because I do get good information from there. And um, so I just thought it was awfully strange that that article was there on Saturday, disclosing some of what was learned about the questions Pienk was being grilled on. And then on Sunday, I go to look, find that same article and it's just literally gone. It's disappeared. I mean, if it was still there, I would have found it. Because I know what the original search terms were that I used. And I would have recognized the article, but it's nowhere to be found. So obviously it got pulled or canceled or withdrawn or who knows. All I can tell you is it was there Saturday, but it wasn't there Sunday. So I'm having to rely a little bit on memory to tell you uh, what I can remember about what it was talking about Joe Pienka being questioned about, <clears throat> which a couple things were significant. I can remember some of it, but not all of it. But let's just go back a little bit on Joe Pienka. As you know, last week, finally, after a very, very long time of um, various members of Congress trying to get an interview with Pienka, never being able to do that, they finally were able to get him in. And uh, it was done in kind of an interesting way, not the way it's normally done. Lindsey Graham didn't notify a lot of people, didn't give them, like Grassley was kind of bent out of shape because he wasn't told. Um, but Ron Johnson was there, so Ron Johnson was there, and also a Senate investigator, the guy asking the questions. That's, as far as I know, I don't even know if Lindsey Graham was in that hearing. 
but we know Ron Johnson was there, and we know that they actually name in this article, which I can no longer find, they named the uh, Senate uh, Judiciary Committee investigator. They give his name, who it was who was asking those questions. It's no one whose name I would you know be familiar with, or probably you, because um, we don't know who these Senate staffers are. But he is a person who works for the Senate Judiciary Committee, who's one of their investigators. He was the one asking Pianca the questions, and uh, Joe. And uh, as far as I can remember, uh, Ron Johnson was there. Grassley was not. Various other Republicans were not. Uh, the ranking Democrat was there. So that we know. Now let's keep in mind, Pink was a major, major key player in all of this. Uh, he was involved in the Flynn setup call as well as the Trump briefing setup, uh, which we now know was approved by Peters and Strokinus and Luce, uh, I'm sorry, Peters and Strokinus and Kevin Kleinsmith. We're talking about that August 30th, 2016 briefing where Trump and Michael Flynn and Chris Christie were there. That's the briefing we're talking about. And we know that there was an electronic communication that tells us who the people were who conducted the interview and also who authorized the interview. And we know that Pienka, that's the one where Pienka was in there and his purpose of being there was to try to spy, essentially spy on Trump and Michael Flynn and try to feel them out about how they would respond to questions about Russia and discussions about Russia and things like that. Uh, it was supposed to be a defensive briefing or some sort of an intel briefing, but it was really a spy meeting, a chance for Pianka to spy on Trump and Flynn. That was August 30th of 2016, and that meeting or that so-called briefing was supported by an electronic communication, which was authorized and approved, signed off on by Peter's been stroking us and Kevin Kleinsmith. Now keep in mind, Pianka is a very strange character, uh, but so is his wife, because his wife is also was is an attorney, and she is and has some connections to the Trump Tower meeting. She also is a, a lawyer who did work for, or basically, yeah, did work for Baker and Hostetler, which we know is a Democrat activist law firm who has a very close association with Confusion GPS. So Pienka's wife is also kind of caught up in the Spygate story as well. It wasn't just Pienka, his wife also has having this uh, uh, connection to Confusion GPS, one step removed. They're both of them affiliated, uh, associated with this liberal activist law firm, Baker and Hostetler. Keep in mind that Pienka was the supervisor of the Crossfire Hurricane agents. All the agents, FBI agents, working on a Crossfire Hurricane answered to Joe Pienka. He was their supervisor. And everything would be reported to him, and then he would report it to his boss, Peter has been stroking us. We also learn that Joe Pientka was Bruce Orr's handler. Bruce Orr's handler. Remember when Bruce Orr was uh, uh, giving, having all the meetings with the FBI? Well, it was Joe Pientka that he was having the meetings with. And therefore, Joe Pienka pretty much being named as Bruce Orr's handler, which means Pientka would have known all about Bruce and Nellie Orr, their association with Fusion GPS, Christopher Steele, the whole nine yards. So Pientka knew everything, which was pro probably why they kept him away from testifying for so long. The fact that he's been given permission to testify now possibly means that he has already testified to Durham and Durham is done with him. Whether or not he's a cooperating witness or not, we don't know. We just do not know. But he's up to his eyeballs in the thing. Now, regarding this article that I could not find on Sunday that I was reading on Saturday, um, one of the one of the things that really jumped out both at me and in the person who was writing the story is that apparently when Joe Pienka is being interviewed 
uh, here just a few days back by the Senate Judiciary Committee investigators and Ron Johnson. They started talking to Pientka about confidential human informants. And when they got into that topic, Pientka got very squirrely. He seemed to have a combination of memory loss and constantly checking with his lawyer who was there with him to see if he needed to answer the question or could answer the question. He got very fuzzy about everything with confidential human and sources, but we certainly pick up one thing from what he did say. Now, because he was in the position he was in, he should have known about all of the confidential informants. When they tried to press on that point, uh, he would only talk about the names that were known publicly, who were confidential informants, that of course being the primaries, Halper, Azra Turk, well, the FBI agent who goes by the name Azra Turk, obviously not her real name. She was the one they sent over to the UK with Halper to spy on Papagalopoulos. Um, and also Christopher Steele. He admits, uh, Pienka admits that Christopher Steele was a paid informant, official paid informant for the FBI. And that, of course, has been... Uh, confirmed multiple times, including by Christopher Steele himself in a recent deposition. But when they got into asking Pienka, they're saying, okay, so we have these confidential informants. Uh, how many of them were there? When they hit on that point of how many there were, he got very nervous and uh, started talking to his lawyer. Then he came back and said, well, you know, I've named the ones some, Azra Turk, Christopher Steele, um, Halper were obviously paid informants, that's public knowledge. Uh, he said there were others, and when they pressed him on others, he's like, well, I, you know, I'll just say that there were others, and they're like, how many? He's like, well, I really don't want to say how many, but there were others, and um, he didn't want to name them nor did he want to come out and come clean. And they even pressed him, so wait a minute, you just told us that you were the senior case agent over everybody who was reporting to you, including the confidential informants you would have known about all these people. You can't tell us who they were or how many there were? And he just hem-hauled on the question and said, well, I, I can just tell you that of the three I've mentioned were definitely confidential human informants that we were using, but there were others. And they're like, well, you didn't even have two or five or 50 or... It's like, well, I, you know, I'm, I'll just say that there were other confidential human informants. So he didn't want to come clean on who the confidential informants were, how many there were, but based on his behavior, uh, it's pretty clear that there were a lot more than what we know. Well, a lot of people. Of course, we know about the uh, one confidential informant that they went back and got was one of Papagalopoulos' uh, friends that he worked with at one time. Uh, they went way back to get this guy. We know about him. Um, this is not someone who he acknowledged as far as what the story is telling us, but we know that that person existed. And I think what we were, what we we're interested in is people like Mifsud and Downer. So he tells us, yeah, there were, there were other confidential informants besides Halper, Azra Turk, and Steele, paid informants, but, you know, he didn't want to name them or even say specifically how many or even say whether or not he knew specifically how many, almost as if, well, I know of some, but I don't know of all, as if he was a little out of the loop after he just sat there and introduced himself as this high-ranking senior official says that he, he was, his title was the Supervisory Special Agent of a Foreign Intelligence Squad at the D.C. Field Office, and his official title is like um, Deputy Head of Counterintelligence. He's right under Peter's been stroking us. He's a number three man in counterintelligence. Under Peter's been stroking us. And Bill Priestep is the number one person. So he got very squirrely when it came to the question of confidential informants. But he did indicate that there were others other than the three that he mentioned. 
So I wonder who he was talking about. Well, hopefully Durham hasn't interviewed him. Can't imagine he, someone on Durham's team would not have interviewed this guy by now. Uh, he was a major, major player. I'm surprised Jensen didn't interview him because of how much he was involved in the Flynn setup. And this is a guy who would be in a lot of trouble. I mean, this is a guy who would be in major, major, he is in a major position of, uh, uh, of being compromised and having criminal liability. Had never been able to even get to this guy. They've been hiding this guy. Remember, they sent him out to San Francisco. And then when we found out he got sent out there, they moved him again. They've been hiding this guy, played in hide-and-seek with Pienka for two, over two years. Finally, they get to interview him. That probably tells us something, exactly what I'm not sure. Either tells us, I think, one of two things. Either he's A, been cleared, and he's in no legal issues, or else he wouldn't be doing this. Or B, he's been interviewed by Durham, and Durham's done with him. And they cleared him to go ahead and talk. But maybe he's limited to what he can say uh, as a result of some plea agreement he's got or something. They also started asking him in co as far as confidential informants, and they moved on and got real specific with him about the, the type of confidential informants because we know from the page struck email that they were talking about um, overseas confidential informants, O'Connor's lures. When they pressed him on overseas, because remember, Halper and Turk were not what you would really consider overseas spies. They're essentially U.S. citizens. Azra Turk actually worked for the FBI. That's not her real name. That's the name she used. We don't know who she is. He didn't disclose that. Um, I'm sure Durham knows, but assuming he's interviewed Pienke, he would have to tell Durham that, or Durham would find out. Because she actually is an actual agent for the FBI. That's who they sicked on Papagloppos along with Halper. But he got, again, very, very rattled, very nervous when they start talking about foreign O'Connor's lures, you know, the foreign informants, agents, spies, whatever you want to call them. He didn't even want to talk about that. Didn't even want to go down that road. But he certainly gave the impression that, yeah, uh, that would have been his responsibility. Overseas spies would have been something he would have been his responsibility. He didn't want to talk about that at all. So obviously we hit a sore spot with Pienka about confidential informants, specifically overseas ones. Hopefully we'll get more to the bottom of that. Hopefully Durham will get to the bottom of that and we'll find out who all these informants were that he doesn't want to talk about, including the ones overseas. Now, these guys, obviously, FBI informants, but as I've said in the past couple videos, the key person in this whole crime is Mifsud. You really need to get to Mifsud. If he's out there, you got to find him. You really have to find out who put Mifsud in the game. As long as they can hide Mifsud, he's the guy who dropped the ticking time bomb on Papagalopoulos. It set the stage for everything else. If you can find out who put Mifsud in the game to drop the ticking time bomb on Papagalopoulos to set everything in motion, you have basically solved this crime. Because you're going to find out who put him in the game. And that's going to tell you just about everything. From there, you can fill in all the blanks. If you cannot find Mifsud, then this whole so-called Russian narrative survives. You can't contradict it. Because at this point, the the narrative is that Mifsud was some kind of a Russian agent. If you can't blow up that Mifsud was, was not a Russian agent, if you can't blow that up, the narrative stands. And everything that the Crossfire Hurricane team did can be acceptable because of Mifsud being a Russian agent. It's imperative that they maintain the narrative of Mifsud as a Russian agent. As long as that's the case, 
they can justify just about everything they did, no matter how shady it was. If you blow up Mifsud and prove that he was put into the game by Strzok or Pienka or one of the Cambridge Four or Brennan or someone like that, Italian intelligence, whoever, you blow up the entire narrative. It's everything. If I'm John Durham, I've got a couple of guys doing nothing but day and night trying to track down Mifsud. He's somewhere, and he's somewhere where he's comfortable in his surroundings, where he's got protections. This guy didn't just fall off the planet. He didn't just disappear. He's probably either somewhere in Italy, around the Mediterranean, or in the UK. They want this guy that can probably find him. And they have to. Or they at least always got to find someone that they interview in this whole process, like Pianka, or Comey, or Brennan, or Strzok. One of those people know who put Mifsud into the game. I'm telling you, if they do not establish who put Mifsud into the game, you get practically nobody. Because the narrative stands. And as long as the narrative stands, practically everything they did could be justified. Weak, crooked, slimy, slippery, on the edge of legal, but they could probably make it fly without getting prosecuted. But if you blow up Mifsud and you prove that he was put into the game by one of these players, Comey or Brennan or Strzok or the Cambridge Four, you blow up the entire narrative. And everybody goes down like dominoes. It's absolutely essential that we find out who put Mifsud into the game. He can be found. If they really want to find him, they can. And if they can't, the Russian collusion narrative as Mifsud is the Russian, as long as that narrative stands, practically everything they did in Crossfire Hurricane will stand a chance of some, a lot of scrutiny. But as long as they can always go back to that, yeah, well, Pop, Papa Glopolis was hanging out with this Russian. This guy's a Russian source, Mifsud. Therefore, everything we did is justified. There you go. That's why I'm telling you. Now for about the third video in a row. Mifsud is the key to blowing this thing up. If you don't, I think most of the people in this deal walk and the narrative survives and lives on and on and on to be used over and over and over again for more and more coup attempts, for more and more propaganda, more and more lies, more and more crap that we have to deal with and put up with and listen to for the next four years. Well, as you know, there's a court case currently going on over in the UK. It's Christopher Steele again battling with Mr. Gubarev. Now, if you remember, Mr. Gubarev sued BuzzFeed for releasing the dossier. The court ruled in favor of BuzzFeed because they said, well, you know, um, BuzzFeed only released the dossier after they learned that Trump had been briefed on it, which made it a new story, which meant it was legitimate and okay for them to release it. Now, the fact that your company was listed in that or named in that dossier certainly could be a problem, but BuzzFeed was just reporting on it. And they did come out and make a correction afterwards and say, okay, this part of it, obviously, we've been contacted by Mr. Gubrev's lawyers, and they're emphatic about the fact that this is untrue, so we're going to go ahead and put this out there that, that this is being disputed. So BuzzFeed was able to make the argument that once they were contacted by Gubrev's attorneys, they made every possible effort to correct what the claim made in the dossier. And so BuzzFeed was able to slide off the hook. But BuzzFeed also was able to say in those court depositions that well, this is information that came from Steele, and we just published the dossier. 
If you got issues with the fact that your name's in there, take it up with Mr. Steele. And that's what Mr. Gubarev is doing right now in a lawsuit in the UK. And that's why we've been getting this information the past two weeks. So now we have some more information as a result, because now uh, obviously Steele has been questioned pretty uh, hard by Gubarev's attorneys about David Kramer. And that's where these David Kramer stories are coming from the last week or so. From Steele's deposition in this current lawsuit with BuzzFeed. But now we're learning that Dan, that uh, David Kramer, of course we already knew David Kramer is the one who actually, um, is the one who actually so-called leaked the dossier to BuzzFeed so they could publish it. But we're learning now from Steele's deposition that that David Kramer was much more involved than what we previously knew. Much more. We know now that Steele and um, David Kramer were working very closely together with Michael, or yeah, with, uh, I'm sorry, David Ignatius of the Washington Post. So Steele and Kramer were working very closely with Ignatius and feeding him stories, both of them. Kramer would feed him stuff, then Ignatius would try to speak with Steele to corroborate things that were being fed to him by Kramer, which were originally coming mostly from Steele. And they both relied heavily on Ignatius. Christopher Steele said in his deposition that he believes Kramer is the one who gave Ignatius the Michael Flynn story. Steele said in his deposition he believes it was Kramer who gave Michael, uh, I'm sorry, David Ignatius the Flynn story. And of course, Steele admits that Kramer was acting as kind of an intermediary between himself and the media. Now, we assumed up to this point that that was primarily Glenn Simpson because he was doing that as well. But now we know that David Kramer was actually working just as much I mean, communicating r r almost daily, a lot, with Christopher Steele. And he was acting more or less as an intermediary, uh, Kramer was, between Steele and media outlets. Of course, we know that at the time, David Kramer was working for the McCain Institute. The McCain Institute. And, of course, um the media organizations that Kramer was speaking to as an intermediary between himself and Christopher Steele would include BuzzFeed, CNN, ABC, Wall Street Journal, and Washington Post. But not only was Kramer providing information, as it turns out he was getting information from news outlets, such as uh, that he received information from ABC about the Michael Cohen Prague story, which we now know is completely false. Steele says in his deposition that none of the Flynn stuff that came from Kramer ended up in his dossier. We know that Kramer testified to the House Intelligence Committee that Steele told him that he believed that Flynn had an affair with Svetlana Lakova. So we essentially have both Steele and Kramer pointing the finger at each other blaming each other for the, the, the Michael Flynn, Svetlana Lakova story. They're blaming each other for that. Steele was asked in a meeting by the FBI agents on October 3rd of 2016, according to Steele, he was asked in a meeting by FBI agents on October 3rd, 2016, to dig up dirt on Trump aides, including Michael Flynn, and that he would be a paid informant. So here's October 3rd, 2016, is when the FBI approaches Steele to ask him, and that would have been that meeting in Rome that we discussed in the last video. It was October 3rd, 2016, when they brought in Steele to be a paid informant, and they asked him to dig up dirt on Trump aides. And we learned that uh, David Kramer was giving Christopher Steele regular progress reports on the media's progress on investigating claims that were made in the dossier. Kramer. Kramer working directly for Senator Magoo. And now we know he was very much involved, more than we even thought.
Does that surprise anybody? No. Thank you for tuning in. Be back next time.